what's up for January. The New Year's first meteor shower fizzles, Mars meets Jupiter in the morning sky, and the U.S. will enjoy a total lunar eclipse. When the Curiosity rover climbed a ridge and the skies cleared up during Martian winter, we had the chance to take this amazing panorama. And I'm really glad we did. Curiosity is inside Gale Crater, a huge basin made by an impactor about 3.8 billion years ago. The mountains across the crater floor are actually the northern rim of the crater. They rise over a mile above the rover. It's so clear when we took this image that you can even see a hill outside the crater that is 50 miles away. I love how you can see Peace Vallis, a channel that once held a flowing river, like many others that formed lakes inside Gale Crater. This is also the first time we could look back and see everywhere we've been so far in the mission since landing in 2012. Here's the path we took. After landing, we drove to Yellowknife Bay. Before we turned southwest through Darwin, Cooperstown, and the Kimberley. The rover studied dark, wind-blown sand at Namib Dune. Curiosity then weaved between the Murray Buttes, checked out Irison Hill, and made a tricky crossing of the Bagnall Dunes before reaching the ridge where it sits today and caught this amazing view. NASA's next Mars rover is in development and has an ambitious mission. Decades of Mars research from previous spacecraft have shown the planet not only had water in the ancient past, but had environments that could have supported life. Mars is our neighboring planet and in many ways the most similar to us and certainly in its history. And the question whether ancient life was there is still the question that keeps us up at night. Mars 2020 has two new objectives to specifically seek the signs of life and then sample materials and prepare a cache that could be returned to Earth by a future mission. Mars 2020 is really the essential first part of a sample return mission. So it actually looks at the environment of these samples and then collects them and stores them. Afterwards, we will of course go and bring these samples back. So Mars 2020 is the first half of our return trip. The Mars 2020 mission to the maximum extent possible follows the Mars Science Laboratory Curiosity mission. We're going to use very similar rocket, a very similar cruise stage, very similar entry, descent, and landing. And the rover, when you step back, will look almost identical. Not only were a lot of designs already developed for the most part, but we're also using a lot of spare hardware that we had from MSL or Curiosity for Mars 2020. If you know where to look on lab, you can walk around and see a lot of the EDL hardware and the crew stage hardware that's already been built. And this is really important for understanding why this mission makes sense. We have to do relatively little in the way of new development 
This saves money, it saves risk, it saves time. It's the right way to pursue this kind of mission. Mars 2020 also features new technologies for entry, descent, and landing, allowing it to target a smaller landing zone and even divert from known risks in the area. It means that we can both go to places that are maybe more interesting to the scientists because we're able to handle places with more hazards, as well as land closer to the things that they're interested in off the bat. So we get to the science that they care about and more quickly. The three key sites that we are considering right now share one thing in common. They are all environments that might have been habitable in the very distant past. One of them is the floor of an ancient lake. Another is a hot spring. And the third one is a site where hot water interacted with rocks in a shallow subsurface. We have instruments on board which are expressly designed to seek evidence of ancient life, what we call biosignatures. And we have the capability to prepare samples, drill them out of a rock, seal them in a tube, so that a future mission could go and bring them up. We call that caching. So it is a first of a new type of mission, which is to bring samples back to the best labs we have, which are here on Earth. Mars 2020 is a pivotal mission in our search for life that could finally answer the age-old question, are we alone? What's up for February? Let's look at some celestial pairs in honor of Valentine's Day. Hello and welcome. I'm Jane Houston Jones from NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena, California. The constellations Perseus and Andromeda are easy to see high overhead this month. According to lore, the warrior Perseus spotted a beautiful woman, Andromeda, chained to a seaside rock. After battling a sea serpent, he rescued her. As a reward, her parents Cepheus and Cassiopeia allowed Perseus to marry Andromeda. The great hunter Orion fell in love with seven sisters, the Pleiades, and pursued them for a long time. Eventually, Zeus turned both Orion and the Pleiades into stars. Orion is easy to find. Draw an imaginary line through his belt stars to the Pleiades and watch him chase them across the sky forever. A pair of star clusters is visible on February nights. The Perseus double cluster is high in the sky near Andromeda's parents, Cepheus and Cassiopeia. Through binoculars, you can see dozens of stars in each cluster. Actually, there are more than 300 blue-white supergiant stars in each of the clusters. There are some colorful star pairs, some visible just by looking up, and some requiring a telescope. Gemini's twins, the brothers Pollux and Castor, are easy to see without aid. Orion's westernmost, or right knee, Rigel, has a faint companion. The companion, Rigel B, is 500 times fainter than the supergiant Rigel and is visible only with a telescope. Orion's westernmost belt star, Mintaka, has a pretty companion. You'll need a telescope. Finally, the moon pairs up with the Pleiades on the 22nd and with Pollux and Castor on the 26th. You can find out about all of NASA's missions at www.nasa.gov. 
That's all for this month. I'm Jane Houston-Jones.